Hello! This is David Panush of the Edmund Burke School, and this is a video lecture of Chapter 3 from Robert Wright's The Moral Animal, uh, pages 67 to 92, and the class that we're in is Social Psychology or Psychology, and uh, here we go. So in this chapter, uh, it is mostly about different sexual strategies of males and females, uh, why they might adapt those different strategies, and what evidence there is when we look at the biological record uh, to sort of um, give us proof that these sexual strategies exist. So we um, begin talking about female sexual strategies, and one of the questions is, in humans at least, you know, why would a female cheat? So um, in other words, if she has a male who's there, who's monogamous, who's providing for her and her offspring, why would she cheat? And the book provides four possible strategies. Three of them are right in a row and the other one comes later in the reading. Um, the first one talks about resource extraction. So here um, is basically the idea that um, she might get gifts from a male whom she sleeps with. So it's simple way to sleep with another male who's maybe not your, your primary mate and that male gives you gifts or um, something like that. Seeds of confusion might mean that if she slept with multiple males um, before she has a baby uh, then they all might not be completely invested in that child but they will at least be sort of moderately invested or at least they won't be negative um, or you know dangerous um, which perhaps they could have been in ancestral and en environments so um, multiple males are kind of not sure whether or not they're the father so the, she might get some parental investment from all of them um, now this may not be as good a strategy and we'll talk a little bit about not cheating but these are possibilities why a woman might cheat or be promiscuous um, best of both worlds is where she can uh, convince a, a male who is really high on MPI to be her husband and then mate with uh, behind his back a male who is really strong um, and fit or something along those lines or smart and so she has a lot of like natural genetic qualities that make the son or daughter successful but she gets a lot of MPI from the father who sticks around. So that's like the best of both worlds. Sexy son is somewhat similar, but might not be the best of both worlds, but simply a strategy that says, whether or not I can find a high MPI male, I'm gonna find a really sexy male to mate with in the hopes that my, my children will also be sexy. Um, and so they'll be successful reproductively in that way, even if they're not, even if I don't have a lot of MPI around to give to that one. Um, and some of the evidence in the biological record, uh, kids always love this, is testicle weight. Um, so from a biological standpoint, um, sometimes there are sperm wars. You know, they, they get in there and they, and they actually have to duke it out um, to, to see uh, which sperm win. And so literally, if a male has a monopoly on access to reproductive females, then they actually don't need large testicles, they don't need a lot of sperm because they've already sort of fought the battle externally and they don't need to worry about the females sleeping around so they know that their sperm are the only sperm getting in, they have small testicles. So actually gorillas who uh, have one alpha male, the great silver-backed gorilla, leader of the pack, who dominates uh, they have very small testicles because they, they're no, 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 no other male is getting access to the females in the pack. Uh, chimps, there's a lot of uh, variation in sleeping around. They're, they're not nearly as monogamous as humans who are still a little bit somewhat monogamous in the sense that there's not as much female sleeping around or cheating. So we know from this evidence, we know that certainly humans didn't monopolize females as much as gorillas did. So their testicles are actually bigger than gorillas, but they're not as as much cheating and sleeping around as goes on in chimps. The chimps have bigger testicles and more sperm. Awesome. All right. So, but here's the fun thing. So strategies are flexible. We don't just say, oh, males and females always uh, have these different sexual strategies and, and they always use them in these particular ways. 
The example in the book is the bluegill sunfish. So I've got a nice picture of our happy little bluegill sunfish here. So the bluegill sunfish, the males have two different strategies. They sort of come in two types, the drifters and the providers. So um, the eggs are external, they're in the water because uh, they're fish. And so the providers are kind of like the high MPI uh, dads sticking around and they guard the egg. So they might fertilize one sack of eggs and then they like stick around and try and guard it um, from predators and things like that. The drifters try to fertilize as many different eggs as they can find, but they keep moving around, so their eggs are a little bit more likely to get attacked by predators. So there are two different ways. It's sort of like volume versus um, you know, quality, or quality versus quantity. And in, in the book, I think, and in our class sometimes, we'll talk about in humans, we'll talk about cads versus dads. So a cad is a guy who gets around, maybe, you know, um, a uh, promiscuous male, whereas a dad is a guy who sticks around. So instead of getting around, it's sticking around. So in the bluegill sunfish, both of these strategies exist within the male population. There's not a single strategy that is the one that wins out every single time. And in fact, what they found, which is relatively interesting, is that the two strategies depend on each other to some degree um, in terms of how frequent you see each strategy within the population. So you don't see 100% drifters or 100% providers. I, I always, I, I think my recollection is it's something like 4 to 1 or like 80% providers and 20% drifters. Uh, you can double check me in the book. Um, and what's interesting about that is that the strategies depend on each other to be successful because if they were all drifters, no, no, probably, you know, very few bluegill sunfish would make it into the next generation because the predators would eat them all. Um, so, but if they're all providers, then it leaves open an opportunity for somebody who is a drifter to fertilize some eggs and have them guarded by a dope who sits around, you know, and guards eggs that aren't even fertilized by him, right? So, you're open to exploitation if they're all providers, but you're also open to exploitation if they're all drifters. So within the population, what we find, and there are different sorts of examples of this in other species, you find um, what's called an evolutionary stable ratio of drifters to providers. It's a ratio of one to the other. They depend on each other, and that's called frequency-dependent selection. So my selection of a particular strategy depends on what other people are doing within my population. I might be more likely to choose one strategy or the other depending on what's going on in the population. And I think uh, in the book they talk a little bit about you can take a bluegill sunfish that's been a provider, um, you know, drop him into a pond with a bunch of other providers and some of them will become drifters because it becomes a better strategy. So they can switch strategies depending on what they see around them. And that's um, the idea of plasticity to some degree is that plastic, like plastic, it's malleable and so we can change uh, our strategies even if though they may seem ingrained, some of them within some reason can be changed when we see that situations, uh, the circumstances have changed. So um, even though it's evolutionarily ad ad adapted for us to have these strategies, um, it's a program to sort of like take an in input, react to it and make a choice. Epigenetics, which is just a word that you need to know, is similar to plasticity, but it's more about how um, genetics are, your genes are expressed differently depending on the inputs from the environment. So epigenetics means, you know, I might have a gene for X, but it only gets expressed in these circumstances Y. And if I never have those circumstances, it never get, gets expressed. Or, but if I'm in, so the gene is expressed differently depending on the circumstances. So it just goes to show that genetics are a lot more flexible and malleable than uh, sometimes we think. So uh, we go on to talk a little bit about self-esteem and attractiveness and how it affects males and females differently. Um, and we know that in the brain there's a neurotransmitter called serotonin and it gives people greater self-esteem. And we know to some degree that some people have more of it than others. They produce it naturally. But we also know that when people rise in status and positions of power, within that individual, their levels of serotonin goes up. So in other words, when they have external factors making them uh, feel like they should be um, feeling better about themselves, then the, in, then the biology reinforces that or even makes, it ha makes them feel that way through serotonin. 
with females when they're feeling high self-esteem, and it's a perception of their attractiveness, it's very tied in, um, then the female strategy becomes to be more restrained, to be less sexually promiscuous. And this is because if they see themselves as being able to sort of marry up or like catch a really great guy, then it makes sense for them to be restrained. Um, if they have lower self-esteem or they perceive themselves as less attractive, then they may be a little bit more eager, promiscuous, to try and execute some of those strategies we talked about at the beginning and just get you know, some offspring into the next generation and, and forego that you know, perfect guy. Um, and a lot of this also has to do with the availability, availability of high MPI men in the population. So if there are no high MPI men, then a female says, well, there's no point in me being sexually restrained because I'm not going to find a high MPI guy. I might as well be more promiscuous. Um, and we have some evidence for this in the book. Males, it affects them the opposite way. So when they have high, st high status or high self-esteem, they become more eager, more sexually promiscuous. Um, and we know that really if you're looking for a good husband, you want a man with moderate self-esteem. Um, you don't want him to be too um, sure of himself because he might be more likely to, to sleep around. Uh, last thing concept we're going to talk about is sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is the difference in size physically on average between males and females in a population. And what it tells us a lot about is how this species reproduced in terms of what we talked about at the beginning with gorillas. What is the level of access to females and how often do the females and males sleep with multiple partners? Sort of a monogamy versus polygamy type of thing. Um, so what we're seeing here, and this shows canine size, which is another measure, and dimorphism. Canine size is it's good to have big teeth if you're going to fight. So you can see when the population is monogamous, that the ratio of males to females is very close to one, which means that they're closer to being the same size. Um, and when we have one male multi-female, those are the gorillas, they have a huge monopoly and the stakes are really high. So those males will compete because only one male is going to get his genes in the next generation. Then we expect to see, because they're fighting, they have to be bigger and stronger. They're going to be much bigger and stronger than the females. And you can see those are the guys in the middle where their canine size and their um, overall weight is much more than a female, like 1.6 times on average than females. Multi-male, multi-female means that we've got some monogamy, but we've also got some, some females sleeping around. And you're not, it's not as dominated by a single female, but there is a lot of male-to-male -male competition for females. In this case, we're still going to see some dimorphism, that is some uh, range where the, the males are, you know, have canines much bigger than females and are overall size much bigger than females. And that shows that, um, that we don't have pure monogamy, that we have some cheating going on, and, that, and it also shows that we don't have one male dominating all the females um, for access to reproduction. So here we go, um, when we compare humans to other primates, in terms of sexual dimorphism, gibbons are the closest to one-to-one, -one. they're about the same. Humans have some differences, male-female. Chimps have even more differences, and gorillas have the most. And so what this is evidence for is that in our history, we had polygyny. In other words, one male, if he was competitive and strongest, strong enough, might have been able to access multiple females. Um, and so he would compete, and that's why we have males that are bigger than females. It also shows on the flip side that females would be willing to be part of a multiple partner situation, and they will mate with a male of high status, so it's worth it for the males to compete for high status. Um, the last thing, uh, point I have here, just a little bit of a quickie, when we think about divorce, uh, that's the lot, you know, who benefits and why does it happen? Um, high status males benefit the most, and it's because it's in our history that look at, that they can go on and have other females still want to um, mate with them. A lot of the evidence for this, I think, even if you sort of look around, is folks you know who are products of a second family, a male of pretty high status who went ahead, stopped with one family, and then started with another family. And essentially, that's one male, multiple females. Running out of time, 
Got to go. If you have any questions, let me know.